time. <laughs> You're going to be hearing it again very soon. <laughs> Hello and good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to St. Luke's United Church in Cambridge, Ontario on this glorious Sunday morning. Blue skies, not a cloud to be seen, lovely temperature and zero rain. What a lovely weekend as our summer is starting to fade away. Nice to see so many of you today in the, san uh, in the sanctuary, in the Mary Clemens room. Thank you for joining us in worship, and thank you to our friends online, Facebook and YouTube. Thank you, Andrew, our service telecast producer, and to Daria, our music director, the choir for their ministry of music today, and to our thumb, Mary. Okay. <laughs> And thank you to those that have been providing refreshments over the Sundays for after church. Um, George, and Diane, Sadie, a number of you. So thank you very much for that. And please stay and join us. We have a few announcements. The Cambridge Food Bank has almost finished their August campaign, Full Bellies, Happy Hearts. Please donate as you are able, remembering those that are less fortunate. Uh, perishable donations or monetary donations can be made each and every Sunday morning and at Tuesday evening at our Truck and Tuesdays. This week's, oh, Belly's Happy Hearts, yes, for sure. This week's trucks scheduled for our Community Truck and Tuesdays are Cranky Frankies and Lady Glazed Donuts. Last week the weather was lovely and the turnout was great. This week's weather also promises to be very nice. So I hope you can come out, bring a family member, a friend, or a neighbor, and enjoy some delicious food, friendship, and fun. Friday, September 1st at 9 a.m. is a global ecumenical online prayer service titled Season of Creation. Please follow the link on St. Luke's United Church website. It's coming on the website. It, oh, it, it is coming on the website. It will be there very shortly, but certainly in time for Friday, September 1st. And the website is www.stlukesunited.com. Dot org. Please remember next weekend there will be no church service in person or online. It is our last weekend for our time for rest and renewal. We hope you all have a safe and happy long weekend. Ah, Sunday, September 10th. We are excited to bring back the corn roast, hot dog and corn roast after service. There will be a free will offering, so please plan to stay and enjoy good food and fellowship. September 10th, yum. Ah, the ever popular retail cards are back. Um, prepaid orders will be accepted up until September 17th. A list of cards are available at the church or on the website, and the list is quite extensive. Please note that the cards received are of full value, but St. Luke's Church does receive a percentage. And now we welcome back Karen Cartmel and her husband Andrew and mother-in-law or mother Dorothy, welcome, <laughs> just recently back from a trip to Newfoundland. So thank you for leading us in worship this morning. We are so very pleased to have you here. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And as Joni says, my name is Karen Cartmel. If you don't know me, I think I know pretty well everybody here, which is wonderful. 
And I think most of you are here were the last time I was here, which is even better. You'll find out why in a few minutes. <laughs> so today is August 27th, and it is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the story of Jacob's Ladder. It's a story that we all, well, sort of know. You likely have sung the song, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. As a child, I see some nods, yes, yes, we know that song. A lot of us sang it in Sunday school or something. But you may not know, really know the story itself. So that's why we're going to look at it today. We're going to start the service by acknowledging the land on which this church stands. As we gather here for worship on this end of summer morning, we acknowledge that the building stands on land that has been walked on, camped on, had campfires on, and lived on for thousands of years. It is etched in footprints, in fire, and faithfulness. We can feel it in the soil and rock and the trees that surround us. It is with humbleness and respect that we give thanks that we are here this day, in the space where we are touched by the Creator who made it and each and every one of us. We covenant to live together and work together and share this land in a peaceful manner with all peoples, as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the air is sweet and pure. As we prepare to worship together, I invite you to take a deep breath in and out. Breathing out all of your anxieties, your stresses, your worries of the week, and breathing in that deep, cleansing breath as we prepare our hearts for worship. So please join with me in the call to community, and I invite you to read the words that are in bold print. As the days are growing shorter and summertime is leaving for another year, we come here to worship together. We come from places of rest, from summer cottages and summer holidays, to gather in this place once more. As God can be seen in the beauty of creation, the tiny flowers, the summer breezes, and the starry nights, God can be experienced in many places. We come here to reconnect with the friends. We come to see the face of God in the face of other people. We come seeking so that God may be known in our lives. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Together let us worship God. Our opening hymn is More Voices, number 122. This is the day, as Daria has alluded to, <laughs> she has played the hymn, she's going to play it one more time, and then we'll sing it twice. <coughs> we'll sing the same verse twice. Yeah, we're going to sing the same thing.
And please join with me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. God of wonder, God of light, open our hearts and minds to your incarnations. Expand our understanding of what is possible through vulnerability. Deepen our listening for your spirit's nudging. Root our living through your self-giving. God of light, God of discovery, open our souls to your gracious touch. Expand our incarnation of humility. Deepen our empathy for the stranger. Root our lives in your grace. God of discovery, God of wonder, walk with us this day, we pray. Amen. And I'll invite Joni to come up and light the Christ candle. On a sunny summer morning, on a dreary rainy day, when our faith is shining brightly, or when it's hidden away, we pause to light the Christ candle, for we know Christ will light the way. And now it's time to pass the peace, and as is the custom in this congregation, we do that by waving to one another. <laughs> so, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Like you just, you just stand up to do this? <laughs> Peace, Andrew. <laughs> and and uh, from all of us, peace be with you. God bless. See you in two weeks in the sanctuary. We'll be uh, back in the usualness again for the rest of the season. <laughs> back in the church. God bless. See you next week. So we're going to be talking about Jacob's Ladder this morning. So I looked for an appropriate poem. But instead of choosing a poem that was based on scripture, I thought we'd just look at the image of a ladder and what else it can symbolize. So listen carefully as my husband Andrew reads to you this poem. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the Ladder by Jim Yerman. The ladder to the diving board ascended to the sky. I said, I don't think I can climb this, Dad. The ladder's much too high. He said, Oftentimes in life, my son, if you choose to face your fear, you will find the ladders you're confronting are not as tall as they appear. Dad was always like that, giving advice at times profound, urging me to climb to the heavens while he was safe upon the ground. But I climbed the ladder and learned a lesson I still hold in high esteem. I feel, I, if I fill myself with doubt and fear, there's no room left for my dreams. And our next hymn is from Voices United, number 299, Teach Me God to Wonder. <coughs>
And please join me in the prayer of illumination. Let us pray. God of grace and God of light, as we listen to your stories in the scripture story, sorry, as you listen to our words in the scripture story, may we be inspired by them. May we discover meaning in the stories. That they stir our thoughts and help us to grow. Help us to hear the words in such a way that we seek and live out your will in all that we do. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 19. Uh, This is the New American Standard Bible version. Jacob's dream. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he happened upon a particular place and spent the night there because the sun had set. and, And he took one of the stones of that place and made it a support for his head and lay down in that place. And he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Then behold, the Lord was standing above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, The Lord is certainly in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob got up early in the morning and took the stone that he had placed as a support for his head and set it up as a memorial stone and poured oil on its top. Then he named that place Bethel, but previously the name of the city had been Luz. This is a story of our faith for which we are grateful. Amen.
thank you, choir, because that song fits in perfectly with what I'm going to say <laughs> next. <laughs> so. so the last time I was here at St. Luke's United Church, we talked about biblical scoundrels. <laughs> and in particular, we talked about Samson. And then we had a little quiz. <laughs> and then I found out that you'd actually look, like to look, learn more about different scoundrels and other people in the Bible. So today, I thought we'd talk about Jacob. Jacob's story, just like Samson's, is an epic one. Samson's story took up four full chapters in the book of Judges. Jacob's story is spread out over a longer period of time. Uh, it goes from Genesis 25, 19, when he's born, right through to Genesis 49, 33, when he dies. Jacob's story doesn't span four books of the Bible. It spans 24 chapters. I mean, it's an epic story. Samson's story was in three parts. Jacob's story is a bit longer, but the best known parts are the first three parts. Samson's story went, good guy, scoundrel, good guy. <laughs> Jacob's story is a bit different. He was a scoundrel in the very first story. So we're going to look at the second story today and find out how he got back into God's good books. The funny thing is, most of us know the first story and the third story quite well. It's the second one that isn't talked about as much, or at least the one we don't understand as well. So just to recap, um, you know, Isaac and Sarah have a son named Isaac. Isaac and Rebecca have twin sons named Esau and Jacob. The birthright is very important as it establishes the hereditary line, who gets the land, etc. And in this case, God has told Abraham that he will have thousands of descendants who will rule Israel. So following the birthright is very important for this reason too. So story one, Esau is the first of the twins to be born, but the mother favors Jacob. So when, one night when her blind husband, Isaac, is about oh, 137 years old, <laughs> she schemes with the scoundrel Jacob. The Jewish claim to inheritance and blessing, or sorry, uh, Jacob dresses up as Esau and he tricks his father into giving him the blessing, the birthright. So Jacob, is dishonest to two of his closest family members. He cheats Esau out of his birthright, but he also deceives his own father, Isaac. Rebecca knows that Esau will be livid when she finds out when he finds out that Jacob has played him. So Esau will likely kill him. So the scoundrel Jacob is forced to leave the family home the only home he has ever known, Beersheba, the, in the promised land of Cana. His mother, Rebecca, suggests that Jacob goes to her brother Laban in the town of Haran. It's about 750 kilometers away. Beersheba is just south of Jerusalem, 120 kilometers south of Jerusalem, and Haran is way up in Turkey. So it's a long way to travel. So that's the end of story one. Now let's skip ahead to story three for a little recap, which I'm sure you know this story quite well, because it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, uh, but mostly because I read the book, The Red Tent. Has anybody else read that? Yeah, a few people. Uh, it's by Anita Diamant, it was published in 1997. I've read it several times because I really enjoy it. It's about Jacob's daughter, his one and only daughter, Dina. But through it, we get a flavor for the environment and the time period. But, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself because the character we're talking about today is her father, Jacob. 
And in the third story, Jacob makes it to Laban's house, falls in love with his young daughter, uh, Rachel. He has to work seven years for Laban in order to marry Rachel. And then, on the wedding day, he discovers he has married Leah, the older sister. So then he has to work another seven years in order to marry Rebecca, uh, Rachel. But that doesn't mean that Jacob isn't enjoying Leah's company. No. <laughs> in fact, Leah bore him seven sons and one daughter. Rachel birthed two sons, including Joseph, Joseph of the Technicolor Dreamcoat, not Joseph, <laughs> and he's also the favorite one. And the two handmaids bore him three sons between them. So that's how Jacob got his 12 sons and became the 12 tribes of Israel and fulfilled God's promise of filling the earth with Abraham's descendants. So that's a quick synopsis of story one and story three in Jacob's life. How did this come to be? How did Jacob get God's forgiveness for committing such a scandalous act? Well, luckily, we just heard this in the scripture today. It's a colorful story full of vivid imagery. Jacob has left Beersheba in a hurry and doesn't get too far the first day. Night is falling, so Jacob takes a stone and makes it his pillow and falls asleep and has a dream. And what did he see in the dream? He saw a ladder. <laughs> a ladder, yeah, that's the answer, ladder. It's a quiz, ladder. <laughs> a very tall, divine ladder that reached from earth up to heaven. And we can all picture a ladder um, I dare say we have all climbed a ladder at some point in our lives. It could be a ladder to clean the lights in the ceiling of our house. It might be a ladder to clean the leaves out of the eaves trough on the outside of our house. Or maybe to hang up your Christmas lights up high. Or in the poem that Andrew just read to us, it could be a ladder going up to a diving board. Earlier this summer, Andrew and I saw a very interesting ladder. We went to Munich, Germany on our way to Austria. And while we were in Munich, we visited several churches, including the largest one, Frockenchurch, Kirch, which holds 20,000 people sitting and standing. A massive sanctuary indeed. And as you can imagine, it was full of paintings and stained glass windows and statues. Statues on the floor, statues in alcoves, statues everywhere. So Mary, if you show the next slide. Here's a picture of me uh, with an angel at the font. It's a Catholic church. You dip your hand in the water and touch your forehead. But you can see it's a, a I was going to say, human-sized angel. She's actually bigger than I am. And Mary, the next photo, please. So here's a picture of the inside of the sanctuary. Um, Andrew is in the bottom right corner. He's got a blue shirt, a red knapsack. Almost looks like he's trying to sneak out of the picture. But he's right there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Uh, and all around him are alcoves. There are different levels, and there are angels in each one of them. And then Mary, the third photo, please. So this is the only time I have seen a statue of an angel carrying a ladder. And it's likely Jacob's ladder. It's a very interesting statue indeed. And I say it's likely Jacob's ladder because ladder is a hapax in the Bible. That's your new word for the day, hapax. It's spelled H-A-P-A-X, hapax. It means there is only one occurrence of the word in the entire genus of literature. So it could be in Shakespeare, it could be in any books of literature. We're talking about the Bible today. The Bible reuses many images. You know, there's seeds, there's mountains, there's uh, 
stones, there's barren women, all kinds of images. But the story of Jacob dreaming about a ladder is the one and only use of a ladder in the Bible. And so, your new word, hapex. And that's why I feel safe saying that this is probably Jacob's ladder with this angel. And of course, if you go to any art gallery with famous paintings by the old masters, you will see many depictions of Jacob's ladder. Usually with Jacob sleeping at the bottom and numerous angels running up and down the ladder or up and down a staircase, or sometimes it's a spiral staircase. But no matter how we envision the shape, the important thing to note is that there's many angels on the ladder, ascending and descending, communication going both ways between heaven and earth, with God at the top and Jacob at the bottom. <clears throat> and for Jacob, that would have been startling. In ancient times, people believed in different gods and goddesses. And each Mesopotamia city was home to a prominent deity. A city's political strength could be measured by the prominence of its deity. Now, Beersheba and Haran were both large cities. So people would have associated a god or goddess with each of those cities. But the places in between, in between the cities, were deemed dangerous. One did not want to get caught between populated areas at night. And that's exactly what happened to Jacob. Everyone believed that the gods and goddesses only existed in populated areas. So when Jacob had this dream where he saw God out in an open place, he must have been terrified. And our scripture reading that Andrew read for us in that translation, it said, Jacob was afraid. But in the morning, Jacob said, how awesome is this place? Truly, God is in this place. And I did not know it. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Jacob realized that even though he was in the middle of nowhere, far away from the city gates, God was with him. God was surely in this place. And J Jacob named the place Bethel. An ancient name for God was El, or Elhoam. And the Hebrew word Beth means house. So Bethel means house of God. And Jacob realized that this dream is important. In those times, dreams were seen as a way to enter the realm of God. They were a way to receive divine intervention or instruction about how they would, people should act on earth. Dreams were seen as a way to connect what lay beyond our earthly beings our mortal understandings. And that's why dreams had to be interpreted. But the dream in Jacob's case was pretty clear. And unlike most of us today, Jacob never questioned that it was the presence of God. And after all the running up and down on the ladder, the climax of the dream happens when God speaks to Jacob. God renews the promise that made to Abraham, who was Jacob's grandfather, that the land will always belong to his descendants. But then it goes further. God also promises that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. God will protect Jacob. And this is the answer to Jacob's unsaid prayers that Jacob didn't dare express out loud when he was at the lowest point of his life. When he, the scoundrel, 
had to leave his beloved home. After he tricked his family and had to leave the city where he knew God was. So now Jacob can embrace God's assurance. Jacob took his stone pillow and set it up as a memorial stone and poured oil over top of it. And this showed that this place, Bethel, or Bethel, was now a place of worship. Now, this is an old, familiar story. But even if you've heard it preached many times, you'll hear it differently each time. Some different aspect always pops out at you. So, what does God want you to hear in Jacob's story today? God promised to be with Jacob always, and God's promise is also true for us today. Now I'd like to take a minute and show you a more recent painting. It's called Jacob's Dream by Mark Chagall. He was born to a Hasidic Jewish family living in Russia and died in 1985 at the age of 98. So this painting was done in 1966. So Mary, if you can show them the painting, please. So Mark Chagall says, since my early youth, I have been captivated by the Bible. It's always seemed to me that it's the greatest source of poetry of all time. Since then, I have sought this gleam in life and art. So I didn't know what the painting meant, so I looked up a website called franciscanfriars.com. And with an art blogger, George Moran, OFM, I gleaned the following information. At first glance, this seems like a strange painting. It consists of two parts, separated but connected by a curved line. On the left side, so Mary, go to the next one. So if you just look at the left side, it's night with disturbing purple colors, with the exception of red for Jacob and yellow, green, and blue for angels. Jacob is depicted standing and not lying down. It is in this position that Jacob sees the angels go up and down the seven bar ladder that connects earth to heaven. And Mary, the next one. <coughs> and if we just look at the right side, we see a large cherub in luminous blue with four wings spread, carrying in the center of his body a lit a menorah, the seven-pointed candlestick, the symbol of the presence of God. The angel illuminates the dark blue night and thus the manifest of the hopeful glare of the divine message. And Mary, if you show one more photo, please. This is the last one. Just above the right wing of the angel, you can see a horizontal cross of Christ. Chagall almost always associates the crucifixion with Jacob's dream. So for Chagall, Jesus on the cross is the ladder from, that rises from earth to heaven. Jesus opens the universe to light. I mean, isn't that a great depiction? from a Jewish artist that understands that Jesus connects us, human beings on earth, to God in heaven. Jesus who came to earth in human form connects us to God. And in the New Testament, in one gospel, the Gospel of John, there is one line about this. John says, Jesus uses this story so that Philip will understand who Jesus is. The heavens opened and Jesus came down. Jesus is the way between heaven and earth. So that's John 1, 51. For Jacob, the place between cities became Bethel, a place where God is found. God was present even in the most difficult part of his life, when he was a scoundrel, and needed forgiveness. So not only was God present, 
But God answered Jacob's prayers and said, I am with you. And we hear these words too. Our United Church Creed says, we are not alone, we live in God's world. God is with us through our celebrations and through our difficult times. Bethel is not a single place. Bethel is wherever God is. Wherever people are living, praying, helping each other, talking to a friend in need. Wherever God's voice speaks to you, that's where God's presence is felt. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we're now going to sing um, the song called We Are Clim Climbing Jacob's Ladder. It's not in our hymn books. It's an African-American spiritual song written in the 1750s. <coughs> Slaves were not allowed to speak to one another, but they could sing. So this song is about escaping to heaven and escaping out of slavery. So you have to watch the words up on the screen. This is the time when we bless the offerings that have been given to this church. These are the gifts of our labors and our hearts. As your offerings are brought forward, let us sing Voices United number 540, Grant Us God the Grace of Giving. gifts, O oh God, for they are part of your story. These gifts represent our reaching out into the world. To tell your story in loving kindness. To tell your story in giving of ourselves. To tell your story in the ways we live for you. Bless us in our giving that we may live the story. Amen.
So let us gather our prayers at this time. And in a moment you will see names of people that we will pray for this morning and hold them in our prayers. So let us pray. Loving God, sometimes it's a struggle for us to keep our prayers alive and effective. We feel we're saying the same thing week after week. Sometimes we even get to the point of wondering if prayer really works. And then we read a story like Jacob's vision and we see how powerful prayer really is. Jacob dreams of a ladder, a ladder that reaches all the way up to heaven and stretches all the way down to earth. A flurry of activity as angels run up and down the ladder, helping mere mortals deliver their prayers. And you, O oh God, are at the top of the ladder, waiting to help us with our prayers. And that story helps us to remember that no matter what we are faced with here on earth, there is a ladder connecting us to you. No matter where we are or what circumstances we are facing, we can always communicate with you and that our prayers really do matter. So this week, God, we want to pray for people Firstly, we pray for people who have something to celebrate in their lives. A birthday, an invitation to a party, or just celebrating the beauty of Earth. Thank you, God, for the pace and grace of summer, as we accept the fact that the days are getting shorter and leaves will soon turn color. God of comfort, we pray for the ill people who are confined to the hospital or to their home. We pray for those who have had medical tests done and are awaiting the diagnosis. And we pray for people who are wrestling with an unwelcomed diagnosis. We pray for anyone living in the fear, in the midst of war and turmoil, in the midst of conflict and confusion, and we open our hearts to them. We pray for the poor, the marginalized, those who have no family, and for those who have no place to call home. We pray for those who have heavy burdens, too heavy even to share with close family and friends. With caring prayer, we enfold those who feel alone and those who feel the heavy weight of grief. We lift now the names of specific people or specific situations in our silent prayers. May your spirit move through their lives, the spirit of healing, of compassion, of warmth, and of love. Gracious God, we gather these and all our prayers together and send them to you, speaking the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Mother and our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is Voices United, number 686, God of Grace and God of Glory.
now please join with me in the benediction and commissioning. As we leave this sacred place, may we take with us the words of scripture, the prayers we have shared, and the joyful music we have made together. As we head out on the same path, may we know that surely the presence of the Lord is in every place we go. So go from here, filled with the wondrous love of God and the compassion of Jesus and the energy of the Holy Spirit, remembering that our triune God is with us each and every day. Amen. Amen. Thank you.